It's the Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert in Baltimore. Following a tumultuous few days in Venezuela, things seem to have returned to a semblance of calm. First, in the morning of April 30th, opposition leader and self-declared interim president Juan Guaido announced what seemed to be an intended military coup, but it quickly fizzled when only a few soldiers turned up to support Guaido. Then, on May 1st, the International Day of the Worker, both opposition and pro-government protesters took to the streets. Meanwhile, opposition leader Leopoldo López, who belongs to the same political party as Guaido, the Popular Will Party, took refuge in the embassy of Spain because there is an arrest warrant issued for his arrest. Joining me now from Caracas, Venezuela, via phone, is Mike Fox. Welcome back, Mike. Thanks, Greg. So, as I said, April 30th and May 1st were quite active. Now, how are things in Caracas at the moment? Are things getting back to normal, more or less? And what does normal mean nowadays, anyway? <laughs> That's a great question. Things are getting back to normal. Uh, they have definitely calmed since uh, the middle of the week. Um, you know, at, at, at the same time, your question of what does normal mean is exactly it. You know, you, you have to keep in mind that this is maybe the fourth uh, major crisis that's happened uh, this year. There was, uh, or, or attempted, you know, coup or push for a coup that's happened in the last four months. You know, you had Guaido claiming himself, proclaiming himself president, and then you had the stand, the humanitarian aid stand off the border, then you had the, the rolling blackout. And there is still a situation outside of Caracas uh, with energy down and rolling blackouts around the rest of the country. Um, obviously, this week was very big, uh, but now things are, are kind of getting back to normal. So you were at the May 1st protests at both the opposition and the pro-government one. What did you see at each one of these, and how did they go? How was the turnout at each? Um, well, I, I, be, I started uh, at the opposition one over in, in Altamira Plaza, um, and obviously, you know, thousands of people came out. It was um, it was a bit subdued. The, people were excited, people were energetic, but it felt subdued from the day before. You know, as you mentioned, the day before, Guaido had 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 called for this uprising. It did not work. He had led a march, and that was was quickly stopped. So um, so and there and there were thousands of people, but it wasn't that massive. It didn't fill up all even all of Altamira Plaza, and then it went down a, a couple of side streets. But it wasn't that big, really. Uh, Wido did, he, he spoke to the people, and of course, they were very excited about that, those who were attendants. Now, they did say, the people that I spoke with, they said that uh, that this is just, uh, an, you know, another step in the long road uh, for their, quote, freedom. You know, this is why those Operation Freedom is what he said he launched on Tuesday. Um, and so they said, you know, they're in it for the long haul. Um, but, uh, but it was definitely not the march to end all marches, which is what Wido was essentially calling for the longest march, the largest march in, in Venezuelan history, which is what he was calling for uh, weeks before. Now, on the on the uh, Maduro side, it was massive. So around the time that Wido started speaking, then I jumped on a moto taxi and ran to the other side of town. I had expected for people already to have been arriving to Miraflores, which is where kind of the end point of the march was. But the march was so large, and the march ran from so far away. We're talking people, they started to concentrate here in, on the, on the, the pro-Maduro side at roughly 10 a.m. the morning. Many of those people, after walking for kilometers, didn't make it to Miraflores until they were only just arriving to Miraflores at 5 p.m. that afternoon. And still, people were kind of, some people peeled off along the way. Many of the people I spoke with uh, in the, the Chavista, the pro-Maduro march, said it was one of the largest of Maduro's government and definitely one of the most exciting. And they said it, it, it really reminded them of marches during the Chavez era, which is to say a lot. Um, you know, uh, I, I spoke with uh, one person literally that night who kind of made the, the connection and said, you know, and a lot of people in the march also said that you know, this excitement was probably based around the fact that there had been, you know, this this attempted uprising the day before, and it was clearly a fail. Uh, and it kind of united people around Maduro, around the Boulevard Project. You know, people had come down, uh, and they were outside of Miraflores on two Miraflores on Tuesday as well to kind of defend the government. So, in a lot of ways, why though, and the U.S. government, they're kind of pushed to try and overthrow Maduro, is actually having an opposite effect for at least. It's uh, for very Maduro supported. It's really consolidating his base and uniting people, people that have been kind of on the left and in support of the Maduro government. It's really uniting them behind Maduro's presidency. Mm. 
Interesting. Now, as I mentioned, Leopoldo Lopez sought refuge in the embassy of Spain. Now, what about Juan Guaido? He hasn't been arrested, it seems, right? And even though the Supreme Court removed his parliamentary immunity a few days ago, what is he doing or planning at the moment? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we know that he's called for, it was, it was during his, uh, his opposition march on Wednesday, on May Day, that he's called for rolling strikes around the country leading up to a large national strike. Now, it's hard to say exactly how that uh, may be implemented, understanding that his base is really in the middle, the middle and upper classes uh, and not necessarily kind of in the, in the working class around Caracas or in Venezuela. So that's one issue uh, that we don't really know how that's going to impact, uh, you know, his, his call for these strikes. You know, it's important to remember also that, you know, the last major uh, opposition strikes in Venezuela was, was during the 2002-2003 oil lockout. Uh, which basically shut down the oil industry and shut down the country for two months when PDVSA representatives uh, just decided to shut down the industry. And then it, it took, you know, uh, over 60 days for um, people loyal to the Chavez presidency to, to, to get things running again and get the boat back to. So that was the last major push for the opposition in terms of strikes and the use of strikes. So we're going to see exactly, um, you know, how that plays out. Obviously, Guaido is still free. And I think that's a very clear strategy from the Maduro government not to not to lock him up and put him into jail and then have that be a pretext for, you know, the opposition to hit the streets and for the U.S. government to say that they're locking up uh, Guaido as, as this opposition, opposition leader and self-imposed president. Mm. Now, here in the U.S., there was a widely publicized meeting at the Pentagon on Thursday of Trump's national security staff, including the uh, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Advisor, the, uh, the White House Chief of Staff, uh, and uh, military officials. Now, uh, and the purpose was to discuss the situation in Venezuela. And shortly before that meeting, Pompeo had reiterated the Trump administration's willingness to intervene in Venezuela. The president has been crystal clear. and. Uh... Uh, incredibly consistent. Uh, military action is possible. If that's what's required, that's what the United States will do. Have you talked to, to people about the possibility of U.S. military intervention more generally? And uh, if so, what's been their reaction to that threat, especially among people in the opposition? Well, I mean, you know, I've been doing a lot of interviews over the last week, uh, and this is a question I've been asking most people. And, of course, those people um, on, uh, you know, Maduro supporters are staunchly, staunchly against any type of intervention, of course. Uh, on the opposition side, there have been some people that I've mentioned that they bring it on, uh, you know, anything that's going to get Maduro out of office, but not everybody. There's been uh, several people that I've spoken that either don't want to respond or they have very mixed feelings about it. You know, uh, intervention, they understand, uh, whether you're, you're in support of Maduro or not, uh, that that is going to be a major issue. You're talking about violence, you're talking about deaths, and you're talking about it, something that could spark, you know, literally a civil war, um, and 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 that will in you know that will include uh, a rising death count, and so I think people are reluctant, even kind of in in in, in the middle, to to even think about what that might look like. There have been some prominent opposition leaders that have also spoken out about um, the potential for an invasion, and said that that is the last thing that they want. And I think the one detail here that is interesting as well is I've been speaking with a lot of people who are involved in the militia, many people in, in kind of the, the, the grassroots on the, in support of Maduro uh, are themselves involved in, in kind of grassroots um, militias. And they are, of course, they don't want to pick up arms, but they're ready uh, to defend Venezuela in the case of a U.S. invasion. And you're talking about, you know, several million people, including the, the 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 armed forces and the militias. So this is not a, a couple thousand people that the U.S. would have to, um, you know, would, would would be facing if they were to invade. You're talking about millions of Venezuelans that are that are that are willing to put their their lives on the line to defend the Bolivarian process. Mm. Okay, well, we're going to leave it there for now. I'm sure we're going to come back to you soon. I was speaking to Mike Fox, our correspondent in Caracas, Venezuela. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks, Greg. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.